Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop at Pitt's Theology Library, virtually, of course, brought to you uh, by the Pitt's Theology Library reference staff. My name is Brady Beard. I'm one of the reference librarians and the instruction librarian at Pitt's Theology Library, and I'm excited to talk with you today about making a persuasive argument as you uh, think about any term papers or anything like that that might be coming up. Uh, you'll notice that there's a handout available for you in this uh, room, and you can download that handout and keep it for yourself. I will also make the slides available as a handout afterward, and you can find all of those materials, both the handout and the slides, as well as handouts from previous uh, workshops on our weekly workshop um, webpage, which you can access by visiting pits.emory.edu slash www. <clears throat> so let's talk about making a persuasive argument. The first thing that I want to point out is that uh, we're all probably very familiar with the idea of outlining an essay or outlining a paper for uh, a class. We This has been sort of drilled into us by our instructors that a really great way of organizing your material and making sure that you're sort of staying close to the task at hand is by outlining uh, the content and what you are planning to say. And what I want us to consider today is that outlining isn't just for content. It's not just for figuring out what information you'll put into which distinct sections of a paper, but outlining is also a way to make the most compelling case for your paper. And in particular, thinking about the type of argument that you are going to make in the paper is just as, if not maybe more important than the content that is actually going to make up your paper. And so my goal for today is that by the end of this webinar, you'll have some tools at your disposal and know where you can go to learn more if you need to, to help you think specifically about how to make the best argument for the content that you have, as well as for the audience uh, that you are writing to. Of course, the main thing that sort of undergirds all of the work that we do as researchers and students and uh, learners is uh, understanding our audience. Uh, understanding the audience can look anything like thinking about the professor that you're writing for or maybe the teaching staff who will read your essay. Uh, it might look like thinking about your classmates if you're preparing a class presentation, or if you are working in a ministry context, uh, thinking about the audience of a sermon or a Bible study. And then, of course, anyone who's interested in sort of thinking about the public-facing side of theological study is probably going to want to think about the audience of an op-ed in a newspaper or the audience of a blog post or a long-form uh, Twitter engagement. All of these things have different types of audiences and different purposes. And uh, you'll find as you write that different audiences are more or less amenable to different types of arguments, different approaches, and even different evidence. So as you think about what would make for the most convincing argument of the paper, my first suggestion is to think about and understand your audience. You are used, as a theological student, you are no doubt used to exegeting texts and scriptures, and this is your opportunity to sort of exegete your audience, to think about the context in which someone will receive the information that you're about to present them. And uh, so understanding your audience is really the first major step to have a clear vision of who you're writing for and why. This will set the tone for everything else you do in this project. Once you have identified the audience, uh, the next step that you want to think about is your research question. Now, a research question is different from a thesis. In fact, uh, a research question is sort of the stage before a thesis. The research question is really your guide to the inquiry. The research question is um, 
is what's going to motivate you through a particular topic and help you decide what is relevant to your study and what is not relevant to your study. These are things that only you as a researcher can be responsible for and that only you can really understand. An outsider looking in on your project or your research may not understand implicitly why you have chosen to look at some uh, sources and not others. And this is, of course, a part of what it means to make an argument. So having a clearly formulated research question at the front end of a project will really be helpful to you. One of the recommendations that we as reference and instruction librarians always make at Pitt's library is that a good research question is going to be specific, both in its formulation, uh, but also in its adherence to materials throughout the research project. You can sort of think of it as um, an anchor. Uh, it's a spot for you to come back to time and again as you find new materials and as you learn more about the topic at hand. The research question is sort of your home base. You can go from it and uh, gather materials and then return those materials to your question. And in this way, a research question is different from a thesis. Uh, and this is what I mean when I say it sort of happens before the, the moment of the thesis. In many ways, your thesis will become your answer to a research question. But in order to get to that answer, you want to make sure that you have a question that is uh, specific and manageable that will uh, help you to think about the topic. Um, this allows you to be flexible as you are exposed to new information or become convinced of others' arguments and reflect on your own audience. So the research question development stage is really the moment that you get to work out a lot of these uh, issues around your research topic. Sometimes folks have, a, a, they wonder how to come up with a research question. And uh, a research question is usually, usually formulated from uh, your interest in a specific topic. And then moving beyond that particular personal interest to the sort of so what question. So um, if you're interested in uh, the ancient Israelites and their relationship to, say, the Canaanites in uh, Iron Age Israel, you might have a general interest in that topic. But other people that you talk to will want to know why that, that particular interest matters and why that topic is of importance. And as you think about answering their uh, imaginary questions to you, uh, you can begin to narrow your question. The more specific your research question becomes, the more manageable it will be. A good way to begin is by consulting reference materials on the topics that are related to your research question or um, that are related to the topic that you're interested in. This will help you to build a bibliography, the most recent reference materials, encyclopedias, dictionaries, things of that nature, will also give you a good sense of sort of where the scholarly field is on this particular topic. It will help you, again, sort of have a home base that you can come back to if you feel like you're getting lost in the weeds of your research. Uh, and reference materials will also help be very helpful in building an initial bibliography as you refine your research. So as you refine your research question, you want to ask questions about your question. How does your question fit within the larger context of the scholarly conversation? What came before it? What laid the foundations for the question that, that you're posing? Does it play a role in any sort of larger cultural system that might be at work? How is it similar to or dissimilar from other topics that are like it? How has the topic changed over time? Thinking about all of these things as, as you reflect on your research question can really help you build a more specific and manageable question that then you can pose an answer to, which will ultimately become the thesis or the hypothesis of your argumentative essay. Other things that you'll want to pay attention to as you think about your research question are to evaluate the question. Is it too easy to answer? What type of evidence are you finding? Does it fit with the question that you've posed? 
If you don't get satisfactory answers to these evaluative questions, you might want to rethink your research question. It's likely that uh, your topic may need to be tweaked a little bit. This is especially true if you're sort of new to a particular area of study. And as you begin formulating your answer to your research question, as I've mentioned a few times, this will become the claim that functions in your argument. And once you have a central claim, you can begin thinking about the types of arguments that you want to make. So there are different types of arguments out there. Uh, and I've just pulled three that you can read more about online, the Tolman method, the classical method, and the Rogerian method. These methods uh, can be used and each one is slightly different from the other, and you'll see that they might fit with your style. One might fit with your style of writing more than another. Uh, one, one may fit with your tone or even your discipline as you think about uh, what sort of scholarly discipline you're, you're writing an essay within. Uh, and then also the nature of your evidence and your research may lend itself to one method or style of argumentation than another. So I'll just make a few brief uh, comments about each one of these methods, and then uh, you can find out more about these uh, online just by Googling uh, these, these different methods. There's a lot of uh, information out there. And, and then I've got some specific sort of suggestions to make to you uh, that come from work we do at Pitts Library, but also from Kate Turabian's Manual for Writers. If you are not familiar with this book, I would encourage you to get your hands on a copy. Even if it's an older edition, uh, it's going to be very helpful for you as you think about the different types of arguments that you want to make and the nature of uh, argument in the sort of written academic form. So the Tolman method uh, of argumentation works to support a claim with reference to clear data, sometimes called the grounds. And these data are factual and convincing. The data is then discussed by the warrant or the bridge, which explains quite explicitly why the data supports that claim. Arguments, long form arguments, will often have more than one set of data and argument and warrants rather that treat an important support for the claim. So you can imagine writing an essay in which you have one major claim, and then the essay works by having different sets of data and warrants that ultimately support the major claim that you've made. And then of course, uh, anticipating as you do in all of these methods, anticipating counterclaims or counter arguments to uh, your position and addressing those as best you can. This is where the Rogerian method comes in uh, sort of very handily, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. The classical method of argumentation, though, comes from the Greek philosopher Aristotle and down through the Roman and Greek traditions uh, all the way to us today. This method of argumentation focuses on careful definition of the claim and a close application of the evidence. The the goal of this type of method is that both the speaker or the writer and the listener or reader will understand the issue at hand as clearly as possible and come to an agreed upon conclusion for next steps. This method starts with an outline of the significance of the topic, historical information that will help the reader to understand the issue sort of at, uh, at best, help it help the reader to understand the issue as fully as they possibly can, and then argue the, the author's position or claim, offer proof for the claim in the form of reasons and evidence, and then anticipate any counter arguments before uh, concluding. Now, the Rogerian method is a little bit different than these other two methods, and it's particularly favored for those who work in controversial subjects or topics because it seeks to find common ground between widely disparate opinions. This method helps the reader to understand the different perspectives by clearly presenting ideas different from the writer's own position. In other words, 
this method argues other people's positions so well that the author's own argument can be viewed as a compromised type of position and be understood as compassionate and empathetic. Rogerian arguments introduce the topic as objectively as possible and explain the opposing views in ways that are recognizable to those who hold the view. In other words, the Rogerian argument really goes out of its way to avoid any sort of straw man opponent. The Rogerian, after it does this, the Rogerian method then proposes why uh, those views, even if the author disagrees with them, may be valid in some circumstances. So you can see that sort of move towards compassion and empathy. And it does this before it turns to the author's own position, which then explains why it is the most appropriate position for other contexts. It then discloses the benefits of the author's position without minimizing needlessly the opposing viewpoint. The goal of a Rogerian argument is to end on a positive note, not a negative one. So this is a brief introduction to different methods of thinking about argumentation, and I would encourage you to learn more about these and even to try your hand at uh, testing out these different methods and, and which one works for you or which one works for a specific discipline that you, that you are writing in. Uh, but I, we do have some general ideas about uh, how you can uh, make an argument. And um, that's what we are calling another way. That's, that is to say, this isn't a precise method, but just another way of thinking about an argument. So first, you want to make sure that you have a basic claim that is essentially what you think about the topic. And then you need grounds, that is reason and evidence for why your, your position, your claim is valid. Finally, you need warrants. These help to support your claim by connecting the evidence to your claim in particular. And then, of course, you want to be aware of counterarguments so that you can acknowledge them and respond to them as needed. Let's take a, a closer look at each one of these, though. So the first part, a claim, should be specific, contestable or debatable, reasonable, significant, and interpretive, not merely descriptive. One of the challenges uh, particularly, I think, in theological and religious studies, is we tend to be very descriptive uh, individuals. And um, we want to describe things just as much as we want to interpret them. And the best claims are those that are interpretive and not just descriptive. A claim should be short. It's no more than a sentence or two. Really, it's the thesis of your work. And the goal of a good, strong claim is to make your reader think about your claim and to make them curious about why you would think that and how you will make your point. You don't want to offer a claim that is not significant, in other words, or that is insignificant. So make a claim specific, short, contestable, that means debatable, and uh, significant. Next, you want to think about reason. Reason and evidence go together, but they are sort of two sides of, of the same coin. They're, they're distinct, even if they are related. Reason is really what I think of as the sort of abstract brain work that you are doing to support your claim. Um, evidence differs in that evidence is the actual data on the ground um, or in a text or, or whatever you're sort of grounding your work in. So reason, you can think of it as the sort of logical work to support the argument itself. Um, reason is based on the evidence, but it's not necessarily the evidence in and of itself. It's that stuff that's connecting your claim to your evidence. And reason, uh, reason comes, it's best when it comes from your own observations. Another tendency is to sort of rely on what other people have reasoned and, and what other people have said. But this is really a, a spot for you as a researcher to make your arguments your own. 
Evidence, by contrast, is the sort of cold, hard research. This is the stuff that comes from the sources. Your sources might be a primary text, a historical document, material culture, or uh, other things like interviews or observations from the, the world around you. For a lot of us in religious and theological studies, evidence really comes from three main areas. The first, which I think of as sort of textual historical study, this is primarily uh, for textualists, people who are working with, with texts or um, uh, cultures that no longer exist. Or, by contrast, those who observe current practices and even interview uh, practitioners of, of religion or uh, theological positions. The goal in dealing with evidence is that you want to represent the materials as best you can. You want to sufficiently address any difficulties and ambiguities and consult authoritative and representative uh, voices, again, to avoid the sort of straw man arguments here. You want to make sure that as you deal with the evidence, you're doing so in a way that is um, in line with, with the field more generally. And again, one good way to do that is to start by consulting reference materials and then moving on. Warrants are what make your evidence distinct to your argument and help you to justify your claim. This is the principle that undergirds your claim and your reason and everything else. It's the clarification to the uh, to your reader, but also to yourself, uh, so that you know how to continue the conversation if someone responds to your claim and your evidence with, so what? In an academic setting, a warrant often allows the researcher to demonstrate the relevance of their reason to their claim. In other words, the warrant helps to validate the claim by offering additional information that is clarifying and limited. Uh, this means that the claim must, the warrant must be relevant, it must be true, and it must be specific to the claim that you're making, not, not universal, in other words. It, it must be specific to the claim and not include limiting conditions that prevent the warrant from being applicable. Avoid basing your arguments on universal warrants and return again and again and again to the evidence. This is what distinguishes a research paper from other genres of writing. And so each one of these parts is really important for thinking about outlining, um, outlining your argument. The win-then formula is one of the simplest ways to sort of come up with a warrant. When X is true, then Y must also be true. Uh, and you can read more about warrants, and in particular warrants in academic settings, in Kate Turabian's Manual for Writers. I recommend that very highly to you. Finally, the best thing that you can do as an author is to practice, practice, practice. If these new, uh, if these argument styles that I've described for you are new, or if you uh, are unfamiliar with these specific methods, try them out. Uh, test them in small papers, in big papers. S begin to see what works for you, what feels comfortable for you, what is convincing of your audience, and what sort of works within the discipline that you're working with. Uh, a Rogerian style argument might work very well in an ethics class, a theological ethics class, but it might not work so well in a class focused on uh, the patristics, for instance, or the early church fathers and mothers. Uh, likewise, a classical argument may work very well for uh, biblical uh, studies type of project, but it might not work very well in a practical uh, theology area. And so just test it out, see what works, see what doesn't. Learn more, you can find lots of information out there on the web, as I mentioned. Another way that you can practice uh, argumentation is by asking questions about other people's work. Uh, ask specific questions about their work. What is their claim? How are they reasoning? What is the nature of their evidence? And how does the warrant function? 
you should be able to identify all of these things in, in an essay and, uh, and be able to find points that you agree or disagree. Doing this, reading in this way, will help you in your own writing and help you to become a more uh, effective arguer and writer as well. Finally, um, you should always feel free to consult with one of the reference librarians at Pitt's library. You can contact us um, any day of the week by um, emailing theologyref at emory.edu, but you can also chat with us Monday through Friday during business hours by visiting pitts.emory.edu slash ask and schedule a consultation with any one of us. We're more than happy to talk with you about formatting and formulating a research question to thinking about the type of argument that best fits the project that you're wanting to, to write. And also, as always, we're more than happy to help you access materials that you may need uh, access to to make your argument really stand out. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope this video has been helpful, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Bye-bye.